so today uh, we're going to talk about uh, migration, migration of animals, but in a very specific context. And uh, as usual, you shouldn't be surprised that it will be a, a polar context, not necessarily Arctic, uh, Arctic only. And uh, of course, we'll uh, have to begin with the basics of migration, migration patterns and uh, general rules and reasons, uh, dangers, benefits. Uh, but then we'll uh, focus on some examples of Arctic, well, animals that spend at least a part of their life in the Arctic or those who spend uh, their whole life cycle in, in, in this region, in polar regions, but they do migrate and not all of them, I think, are very much well known. Uh, and, and also, uh, not everyone is aware that amongst those animals that migrate in polar regions or from or to polar regions, we have some uh, very magnificent record holders. Just let me get back to uh, my previous my previous view. Um, somehow I lost ability to yes, and I'm back. So what is animal migration? Uh, we should always be aware of the difference between the migration and only a temporary or small scale dispersal of animals. So, in general, animal migration is relatively long distance. It's, of course, the movement of individuals. Usually it's on seasonal basis. Uh, but as we'll see, that's not always the case. And the trigger for the migration may be like climate, change in climate, or may, rather change in weather more frequently. Uh, local availability of food, uh, the season of the year, of course, and or for some other reasons like mating. So to be uh, acknowledged as, as true migration and not just local dispersal, local movement, local eruption, the movement of the animals should be of this seasonal occurrence or maybe annual occurrence, rather regular, such as, for example, northern hemisphere birds migrating south for, for the winter. That's, that's really obvious. But also uh, wild beasts migrating annually for seasonal grazing. And so the crucial thing is maybe not even a distance as such, but a major habitat change as part of their life. Uh, another example, young Atlantic salmon leaving the river where they uh, begin their life cycle and go, go, go to the sea to complete the cycle. So what sets migration apart from other forms of movements is that it typically involves traveling from one type of habitat to another for different reasons. Most, most frequently because in that particular period, this new habitat um, has more favor favorable, offers more favorable conditions. Uh, so who's up for a trip? Uh, I started with an example of Northern Hemisphere birds, which are very well, uh, very well known, very well observed. Actually, the whole interest in animal migration started with with birds, and for for many people, uh, it stops there, it's because we're accustomed to migratory birds. Uh, so, it is best longest studied, like crane, cuckoo. Uh, stork and, and, and so on. So this is the first thing that comes to our mind. But frankly, migration is in practice found in all major animal groups, including not only birds, but mammals, fish, reptiles, amphibians, but also insects and crustaceans. Uh, so even the smallest 
representatives of animals can migrate and as we'll see uh, they are record record holders as, uh, as as well even the smallest ones so the guinness records uh who is the smallest migrant that's cell plankton actually which is uh, for example, club, uh, crab larvae and copepods, and copepods are um, especially significant and important group in uh, in polar regions, in Arctic regions, in, in Arctic region in particular. And they're very, very tiny, uh, an individual, an adult individual, adult form actually is maybe up to one, two millimeters long. So that's the, that's the smallest uh, migrating animal, but it's actually a record holder also in another context, but we'll get to that. And the largest migrant in, uh, in contrast is a blue whale, uh, which is the, uh, the largest mammal on, on Earth uh, and can grow up to 27 meters long, to, to be 27 meters long. Uh, another representative of whales is humpback whale, which also lives in polar regions, and it's uh, holding a, a record in longest mammal migration. So each way it travels even up to uh, 8,500 kilometers. Uh, another one, maybe let's stick to the polar ones, uh, because you can see at least three, four uh, of those Guinness record holders are Arctic or polar animals. And uh, so the longest record round trip is quite well known because it's 80,000 kilometers. And this record belongs to Arctic, uh, Arctic Tern, which is a very particular case that I will show you as well. Uh, such long and regular journeys must come with significant risks. And uh, this requires very different strategies. Of course, those uh, strategies depend on the reason why the migration takes place in the first place. Uh, and the conditions that, 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 that are met. So there are basically three main patterns of migration, which is journal movements, which uh, is a day-night cycle, uh, seasonal movements between uh, habitats, or long-distance uh, journeys. But actually, this, the, the long-distance journeys can also be seasonal uh, movements, but that's not always the case. For example, uh, for the Arctic turn to complete the cycle, it takes more than one year, actually up to two, three years, depending on uh, mating conditions and, and, uh, and so on. So it doesn't uh, necessarily repeat every, uh, every year. So what are those reasons? Why do animals take this risk? Maybe uh, from animal perspective, it's not a conscious risk that is being taken, but uh, observing all the preparation or the adaptations, it's uh, it's an evolutionary product of of, uh, of high quality. Uh, the, this adaptation to migrate, but what it means that it has to bring some benefits that are larger than the risks, right? So that's uh, that's the whole point. Why do animals migrate? It's driven usually by a very simple fact that resources on Earth fluctuate. So we have warm summer months followed by cold, which is rather inhospitable. Uh, we have plants or other meals that may be abandoned but only for a short time. Uh, also, the best place to give birth or hatch young may not be a good place to find food. These two don't always come together. Also, the conditions for the young, uh, for the offspring, may not be favorable to 
uh, the conditions that uh, the adults live in normally might not, not be uh, favorable enough for the offspring, uh, offspring, which is usually much more vulnerable. So while migrations can be very complex, different patterns, very varied, the, the motivations behind them are usually rather simple. So food, breeding, climate slash weather, those, those are the, the recurring recurring teams. Uh, of course, it all comes with the risk, especially if it's a long distance journey uh, throughout different habitats uh, and dif different climate conditions and so on, but not only even those diurnal um, journeys uh, carry some risks. But so th those dangers of migration include natural ones, let's say, so bad weather on the way, uh, exhaustion and starvation. Some uh, of migrating animals uh, have a strategy of not feeding or almost not feeding, uh, not hunting uh, on the way. Some have some pit stops, but still the, the time is crucial, so they don't have uh, prepared pit stops uh, all the way, usually it's one, two or three at some points of the journey in the very beginning to uh, to gain some weight, to uh, be prepared for, 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 for what's to come. Uh, but of course, those pit stops, those habitats um, are, can be modified and are often modified by either by nature or by human activity. So uh, sometimes uh, the animals, for example, birds expecting to have a nice, uh, nice place to, 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 for, uh, to, for a, a, a such pit stop uh, can be very much disappointed because they find uh, new, uh, new, new buildings, right? Uh, uh, right there so the, the conditions are not favorable and then not they are not able to prepare themselves for uh for, for the further journey on the way we have more natural dangers such as predators also uh animals can and sometimes do get lost even though they are very well prepared uh, prepared by by nature by the what's in their uh, dna <laughs> Mostly, even though there are some discussions, what is uh, what is that they inherit as the behavior, and what is what parts of those behaviors are learned on the way by observing others. I, it's probably the combination combination of of both, uh, and there are more man-made dangers such as collisions with man-made objects. Uh, man-made pollution, like oil spills, uh, and also very directly poachers, hunters that uh, use the vulnerability of the animals on on their journey. In case of whales, uh, the collisions with with ships, which are maybe not uh, maybe not fatal, not always fatal. Uh, in the very beginning, but are but, but keep weakening uh, them, and also uh, those animals that base their uh, they fall, base their itinerary, itinerary on mm, on echolocation can be really confused because of the ships, because of man-made noise uh, on the way. So the dangers are. Uh, really hard to name them all and hard hard to describe but somehow like i said it must be still worth uh, worth the risk or or is it so uh i mentioned the uh the, the discussion about what is in animals dna uh, what is that they inherit from from their parents and what is like a learned be behavior observed uh, 
And um, the first question is, how do they know when to go? Because where to go is another thing, but when, when to go? They, we observe birds or other animals gathering in one place, or there is also uh, a phenomenon like being very unsteady right before the journey. So at first, if, for example, in the colony, in the colony of Arctic terns, when the time to, to go south or north uh, approaches, then in the first, uh, at, at first, it's complete silence and it uh, lasts for some time and then it's very, very hectic and everyone, every bird is preparing for, for the journey. But how, how do they know? Do they only observe each other? Um, so that's, that's one question. Another question is, uh, it's easier to comprehend for us humans when the journey is like seasonal. So we can assume that the animal knows that they have some purpose, they have some destination, and then they will come back, no matter how, how it knows. But sometimes the, to complete the full cycle, to complete the full journey, it takes lifetime for a salmon, or even more than a lifetime in case of monarch butterfly, those butterflies that are also record holders and make very picturesque journeys throughout the US. So if it takes more than a lifetime to complete, how is it how is it possible that they know they know what to do if they have no memory whatsoever of what was before or what comes after? Especially when it comes to insects like like butterflies. So it's a combination of both of external mechanisms is external factors and internal factors and internal mechanisms are usually hormones which are triggering this unsteadiness this urge to to reproduce to mate to reproduce to eat to uh deposit fat for for the journey ahead and it is usually so these are the mechanisms but the, which is triggered by hormones but those hormones are usually triggered by external signals, which is temperature or change in temperature, change in light, change in availability of food. Let's start with light. So photoperiod uh, is shown to be involved in the timing of many activities of many species. It's initi uh, initiating this, it's Actually, it's in German, uh, but it's you, you, quite often this term is quite often used in the in the communities. It's zugung unruhe, So this rest, restless behavior, like this pre-migration phase, starts. They they also hectic. They're so restless. They uh, move around. They make a lot of noise. They tend to eat a lot and also gain weight. Gain weight because they eat a lot, but also because of the hormones that allow them to. Uh, accumulate more more fat. So uh, this may come as no surprise. Is this photo period is a very reliable indicator of time of the year, and can be used as a very useful predictor for uh, the change in in resources. So we uh, the temperature is not that uh, not as reliable. It plays a big role, but photo period plays the the, the crucial role. Uh, of course, other local and short term factors are influencing timing of migration include weather conditions, prevailing weather conditions, temperature, wind, drought, precipitation, uh, because all that can, of course, significantly influence the, the costs carried by by the animal of the travel of the travel ahead. Uh, so this internal clock based on or triggered by external signal primarily of the light is what makes uh, the animals start 
preparation, not the journey itself, but at first preparation, this pre migratory uh, phase. And so um, this, this state is an important cue as most migrants undergo significant morphological, physiological changes in preparation for migration because of those changing hormone levels and, and so on and so on. Uh, again, how do offspring decide where and when to migrate? How do they know? So it is now believed that migratory behavior can be both genetically, culturally determined. So in this cultural transmission, the young just observe and copy their parents or other group members' behavior. So, uh, the species with culturally, mostly culturally transmitted migratory behavior are expected to have a very social lifestyle. Also longer lifespans to live long enough to gain this um, experience and share it with the offspring. Uh, and also an extended parental care. So we expect this to prevail in those species that care for their offspring. So had this strategy to not have as many offspring as fish, for example, or, or, or insects, but instead take a good care of them. Uh, so preparation is, is the key. So hormones, as like I said, trigger a huge, huge appetite. Luckily, there is still enough food in the location, although we know that food will be probably scarce in the near future. So they start eating voraciously. We're talking about, of course, about those seasonal and long distance journey, journeys, not the journal journeys that are a very particular case. So uh, they eat a lot, they gain significant amounts of weight, uh, even they change their diet. So many of those that is, are insectivorous, so their diet is based on insects, supplement their diet with fruits, grains, other items. Everything that can be converted into a body fat is, is good. Then they're burned efficiently for, for uh, uh, energy. And it's very important to gain enough weight because, for example, some birds, some migratory birds, can lose up to half of their body weight during migration, so they have to come prepared and make a lot of uh, fat deposits. Uh, so this Zugunruhe, uh, this restless, allows them to do that. So they, they need to eat a lot, so they need to spend a lot of time uh, searching for food and eating. So they are restless, especially at nighttime. Normally they wouldn't be, but they, they continue to search for food. Uh, also, this fat is one thing, but physiological changes uh, also include changes in their feathers in, in case of birds, of, uh, of course. And the feathers are, are getting nice and strong and it allows them to be more, uh, more efficient during the journey. Uh, so the, some might mold their old feathers and have new ones grow, which are specifically adapted for uh, for the journey. But what happens during the, the journey, during the flight in that case, but it's of course uh, for, uh, for, the, for, for the birds. Uh, many, and why birds? Because they have particular adaptations, like many of them fly together in a very specific formation. You can see it above. And probably that's for energy saving reasons. The, the flight power flight power demands and energy expenditure can be reduced that way when the birds fly at this optimal spacing an optimal uh, angle they're using the wind how do they know it they just they just know uh, also it all allows them to uh, allows them for a better orientation and communication within the group so that no one is left behind so it's so-called v V formation like geese, for example. Uh, some uh, during during the journey, some species 
have altered their immune system and also tissue repair functions. So they use extra energy for that, but they have gained weight before and they need to uh, survive the journey, uh, avoid predators, even the, if they get hurt, even if there's a collision, they need to go on. Otherwise, it's, um, it's the end for them unless they get saved on the way but that's you know that's that's really the case many of them do not survive the, the journey uh, so finally this journal patterns journal dial vertical migration so-called d the m this happens uh, on a more much more larger scale that we are aware of it's a zooplankton and it's a global phenomenon uh, which is characteristic for marine and freshwater environments, but it is particularly significant and very important uh, in, uh, in the Arctic. Uh, first of all, why? So first of all, Arctic Ocean is rich in zooplankton, very, very rich in zooplankton. Uh, and second of all, due to uh, mm, some of those observed mechanisms, uh, the cold pots that undergo this, this phenomenon, this, this journey, uh, are a crucial part of the uh, food, food web in, in the Arctic. So this, uh, this is why this uh, journey, everyday journey, becomes uh, also a very important part of this uh, of this whole ecosystem. So the gr Earth's greatest migration and the, the greatest influence of the migration happens here. It's a the, actually zooplankton is a record holder. Zooplankton as a whole is a record holder in this uh, vertical. Uh, migration, vertical migration that is depending on the time of the day. So, what happens during this uh, journal or dial uh, vertical migration of zooplankton? Uh, it's it's quite simple. So, at at night time they travel up to the uh, towards epipelagic zone. And uh, at daytime, they uh, they sink. You might say or they travel downwards, and it repeats and repeats and repeats. And all this movement consumes a great deal of energy. So these are the hypotheses. Why why is it worth it? They're not really changing the environment in this case. So we're a little bit on the edge of the migration um, definition. Uh, for many animals, the best explanation is that they swim up to food rich surface waters uh, at night to feed when there is little light. So they're sort of hidden from predators or better hidden from predators, at least for from those predators that rely, rely on light to sense to catch their prey. And the migrators then return to the depths before the sun rises. So that will be the avoiding strategy. Also, the zooplankton may migrate to reduce UV, so ultraviolet damage to their DNA, uh, or to use the currents that are different on different uh, levels in, in different uh, surfaces of water to move to areas with more food uh, or maybe to take advantage of the benefits of colder deeper waters to grow larger or produce more eggs so there are different hypotheses the most established one is the one regarding avoiding uh, predators but it, it must be more than uh, that and this greatest migration on earth in terms of mass has big impact on ocean and planetary system. For example, when those uh, plankton eating, I mean algae eating organisms leave shallower waters during the day, so they go down, 
primary producers, that means organisms that convert sunlight to food, uh, like the base of the food chain, are able to multiply with less of this pressure of zooplankton grazing on, on them. So, moreover, uh, the scale of migration can be so large that it even creates turbulence in the water itself, not only relying on turbulence, but also creating its own. Uh, so, this movement through water column down and up is, is very important. Also, it plays a major role in the carbon cycle. Uh, but, okay, we are uh, mainly in the Arctic. I, I said, like I said, it happens uh, worldwide. It's not only limited to polar regions, but it's especially significant in the Arctic. But in the Arctic, especially as, as we go north and north and north, and the same thing happens uh, in, in the south, uh, there are prolonged periods of time where there is no sunlight available, right? When we have polar night, but what happens then? Then it, does it stop completely during the polar night? But also it should st stop during the polar day, right? Uh, so uh, the f in large parts of the Arctic, it shouldn't be possible at all because this uh, daily cycle, journal cycle is uh, disrupted from this point of view. But the lunar vertical migrations then take take place and replace like the, the moon replaces the the sun in a way. So this LVM in contrast to DVM occurs across the entire uh, Arctic. The periodicity uh, is a little bit different because uh, of, of the difference between sunlight and lunar light. Uh, but it's still, it's, it, it's a movement that actually does not stop even during polar night. So even if it's, so if it's during polar night, uh, it, there are more things to, to explain, right? Than just searching for food because food is scarce or even unavailable. Uh, phytoplankton is unavailable during the polar night. So there are still many factors to, 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 to explain. Uh, so to sum up this journal migration, the zooplankton faces a dilemma. If they stay in the surface waters to feed, they risk being eaten. If they hide in the deep, they will be okay safer, but soon they will starve. So this is like a sort of trade-off. Each option brings a gain, but also a cost. And it's like a clever solution to balance this, this trade-off and have and try to have the best of uh, both in this game of pretty much hide and hide and seek. Uh, I mentioned uh, Arctic Turn as being a record holder, actually uh, an absolute record holder in the world of migratory animals in total, meaning how long their journey is. Uh, so a little bit about the Arctic Tern, this little bird with a black cap and uh, red beak, the small bird, uh, nothing unusual you might say, but actually it's uh, its journey is still not fully explained. Uh, so it's a water loving bird. It, uh, as we can see, it eats fish mainly. It's seen here with a fish in its beak. Uh, and it hatches during summer in the north, in the Arctic Circle. Uh, so during the cold, dark Arctic winter, then, then, then they fly south. And that it's okay, it doesn't, doesn't surprise us at all, but why does it go so far away to another unfriendly region, another polar region? That's, uh, that's not, I mean, the, the, the explanation is not fully established. So, uh, it is said that um, uh, they fly this huge distance following 
the summer season all the way. I mean, it's like following summer and also following sunlight. It gets the most of the sunlight of all the species on Earth. Actually, the distance they fly every uh, during every journey is even longer than this approximately uh, 30,000 kilometers one way from Arctic Circle to Antarctic Circle because they do not fly uh, in a straight line. They need they're dependent on some fuel stops, not not many, and also uh, local local conditions. So, uh, like I said, it nests once every one to three years, depending on the mating cycle. So it's not that each Arctic turn takes the return journey uh, uh, every year. No, it can take um, more more time. But once it has finished nesting in the north, it takes to the sky and goes for another long southern um, house migra migration. Uh, so, like I said, it's clear why they go south, because the Arctic winter is too dark for them to hunt. It's not it's not uh, friendly. Uh, but the why do they go so far? Why do they take all the risks? Why uh, why um, why do they take so many variations of the rules that these birds uh, uh, takes? It it takes a lot a lot of time. And why do we know? How do we know? On the left, we can see the photo of geolocator on birds leg so they're very well uh, followed and it's we have records of them traveling so this is how we know their uh, the, the route uh, so like i said it's been suggested that the arctic turn going from arctic summer to antarctic summer so following summers uh, gets more daylight than any other animal so why do they migrate so far the answer would be they're loving sunshine so so much also uh, on the way. Uh, so how do they survive on the way? They're uh, apart from fuel stop in the beginning. They survive the journey hunting a little bit by diving while flying to fish and um, and crustaceans. And of course, they still have this Zugundrowe. I mean, uh, travel restlessness. Before the journey, they gain weight, but still they don't rely. They wouldn't be able to rely on what they gain before the journey for the whole uh, trip. Uh, how do they find the uh, way? Uh, they use landmarks, landmarks that they remember. So it means that they gain, uh, they gain the experience which every, with every trip. Uh, but there are also very important other very important mechanisms such as, as sun orientation they will orient their body at a center certain angle in relation to the sun and the time of the day so again there's an external factor external stimuli that activates a portion of the brain uh, necessary for navigation and navigation and allows uh, the organism to adjust their orientation their body orientation in relation to to the sun. So um, they leave the nest in the morning when the sun is low in the sky and plans to head in a known direction and it will travel in a central direction with a sun in a position related to its body. It's like an internal sun compass. That's what it's called uh, actually. But also they travel in the night. So what happens in the night? In the night we have night sky orientation. Uh, there was a pioneering experiment showing that some birds were placed in a planetarium. And uh, the planetarium was showing the night sky oriented, uh, the night sky. And the, the birds oriented themselves towards uh, the south during this uh, migration period. So the planetarium sky was then slowly rotated and the birds maintained their orientation with respect to the stars. So they are able to observe the stars and maintain their position, their body position in relation to the stars. 
Uh, so this was observed among birds, but also even among some beetles. So we would say uh, much less developed uh, animals, at least from from our perspective. Uh, another mechanism is uh, magnetoreception, also studied by behavioral experimentalists. So uh, uh, they investigated in which way uh, geomagnetic information is used for orientation. So, uh, get back to this unrestlessness uh, time period before migration. Even if birds were placed in cages, so there was no way for them to, to, to leave, and also they had a regular abundance of, of food, uh, they were so eager to migrate that they would assemble in cages in the direction where they want to migrate. So they didn't see the sun, they didn't see the stars. So how did they know where to head south, for example, in, in fall? So uh, if the magnetic field was changed, so the magnetic south, they wanted to go to appeared in a different direction, birds would assemble in this new direction. So this proves that they use this magnetoreception mechanism. So uh, it demonstrates that they indeed use magnetic uh, clues. Actually, they have birds have special organ in their ears, magnetite. Uh, like a tiny piece of iron working as a sort of a compass. Uh, another um, adaptation is uh, cryptochronite uh, crypto in their eyes that allows them to sort of see magnetic fields, something like uh, an ability that we don't have, something that we don't see with our eyes. Another um, very well developed mechanism is olfaction, especially increased or Piped during migration. So, olfactory navigation means that they they are led by smell. It's all it's suggested as a possible mechanism in some birds, like like pigeons. So they have like a built-in map of smells. What can they expect in particular area, and they go towards the smells that they. Uh, they know it allows them to recognize where they are by the local other uh, other and it's not all uh, only the case for uh, for birds it's also the case for salmons for example another arctic animal uh, which is uh, a record holder in a way and a very uh, prominent migrator so the caribou migration is the longest land migration on planet Earth. So together with with our uh, record holder Arctic Tern in the air, and back to uh, back to humpback whale in, in water. So caribou migration is the third uh, Arctic animal that holds a record in terms of the route of migration. But caribous live in very different geographic regions. Of course, we know the difference between a caribou and a reindeer. There are some physiological differences, but basically they are the same species. Reindeers have been partly domesticated in some parts of the world and are used much like little dwarf horses. But caribous are still completely wild and it still influence how uh, what they look like and is still influence their behavior because reindeers they do move they also do move and it is used by uh, but by those who domesticated them and use them for for milk mostly milk or fur or meat in the past uh, but caribous take those long long uh, journeys and some herds of caribous migrate even more than 1,000 kilometers in Canada, in Alaska, each year to get from their wintering grounds to breeding grounds and back again, of course. And why? Because of uh, calving, 
lactation, antler development. Uh, the spring and summer period required the greatest abundance of food, so it has the greatest dietary needs. So they need a lot of uh, food in that period. Uh, so the purpose would be abundant high high quality food, abundant high quality forage, green vegetation, right? They are, they they uh, they eat plants, so they need uh, a lot of green vegetation. So the the green vegetation emerges uh, far north soon after calving, and it provides nutritious food high also in in protein. So caribou need this high protein intake to fill nutritional deficit deficits accumulated over the winter. So they, they need to, females need to produce milk, they need to gain body mass during the short summer months. Uh, but uh, the summer months are still not easy for the caribou. And one of the factors that really is irritating are mosquitoes. It's much more irritating for them than we might uh, imagine. Mosquitoes, biting flies, other insects, parasites, they harass caribou all the time. And they are the primary direct driver of caribou movement during this time. So they search for food, by, but they are ready to trade food for uh, avoiding those irritating, biting flies and mosquitoes. But it only can happen, but they can when there is enough food in the north. So there is a balance between searching for a safe ground from the mosquitoes and the one that offers enough protein-rich food again to accumulate it, to accumulate fat for for the winter to grow antlers to produce milk for the offspring and and so on. Uh, again, they have uh, some adaptations that allow them to uh, to travel safely. They're great swimmers, and they have to sometimes they have to cross large uh, rivers mostly uh, to, during their during their journey. But uh, what helps them is their double layer of fur, insulating fur. Uh, it is very warm, but it is also completely hollow, and those hairs uh, provide them um, not only warmth, but also uh, act like life vests, so allow them to uh, stay buoyant uh, in the in the water. This is why they are such great, maybe not fast swimmers, but great swimmers. So it protects them also in this way, like a, like a like a life vest. Uh, their body structure changes between summer and winter months. Uh, for example, they, they hooves for the winter, they benefit from a little bit different build of their hooves than in the, in the summer. So uh, while swimming, while migrating, the hooves can serve as, as, as paddles, allowing them to be more efficient in the water. Uh, so, uh, the, this, this, those adaptations do not only happen in case of birds, but also in case of caribous. More caribous than reindeers. Of course, reindeer struck, build uh, changes too between summer and winter, but it's not that related to, to migrations. And, yeah, to, to sum up, uh, they tr in the spring they travel to caribou travel to coastal plains. They then give birth and uh, move further north as soon as there's green supply there, and it allows them to escape plagues of mosquitoes. Then, but then they come back once the north does not offer them too much food anymore. They move back south. It's safer from it's safe now from the mosquitoes to warmer areas as the winter approaches.
So we were in the air and we were on land and now we have our Arctic, maybe polar record holder in water, which is a humpback whale. A uh, humpback whale is quite big, as you can see. You can see its size uh, here. Uh, it's not the biggest of all whales, but it makes longest migration of any mammals in the world. Uh, humpback whales are not as large as blue whales because they can weigh up to 40 tons and uh, be as long as eight, uh, 18 meters. Uh, and we have different groups of uh, humpback whales because they live well, maybe not worldwide, but but in many many oceans. But those from the northern hemisphere travel from their summer feeding areas in cold or temperate cold waters to breed for the winter in subtropical or tropical waters. So we would say a normal pattern of migration. When the winter comes, they go south to the tropics. Uh, of course, since the re seasons are reversed. Uh, each side of the equator, the humpback whales that are in the southern hemisphere also uh, um, head uh, south towards the pole to feed at the same time, which means these whales don't normally cross paths, so they do not meet at the equator in the meantime. They all go south when the conditions are less favorable. Uh, because the seasons are reversed. So why do they undertake this journey, which is, like I said, can take up to 8,000, 8, 9,000 kilometers? Uh, well, humpback whales are very well observed, one of the most watched animals, well-studied species of whale, because they're find, uh, because they can be found in every ocean. Many uh, areas uh, that are associated with marine tourism also focus on this whale species for whale watching operations for, for touristic reasons. Uh, because also, it's known for its spectacular behavior, meaning the surface active behavior, uh, which can include breaching, like leaping clear of water. Uh, tail slapping, occasional, uh, and such, such behavior is a curiosity for, for the tourists, for the for whale watcher, watchers in tour boats. And also they have those complex, beautiful songs, which can be heard on the breeding grounds. Uh, but the breeding grounds are where? Are in the tropics. Why are the breeding grounds in the tropics? Uh, so. So, so we come back to the questions, why do they travel at all? Uh, so why do they go from the summer uh, season near polar regions uh, to, to, to more tropical waters? Uh, first, they love polar regions because, because they can feed there. They can feed on krill or copods, plankton, other on, and smaller fishes. But when the winter season uh, begins, they migrate to equator again to mate to give birth to their offspring, and their offspring is called calves. So, so it's calving, and they give birth to calves. Uh, the, the journey itself is not that difficult for them. They have a massive tail fin, and it helps them to move easily across ocean waters. Uh, so it's not that they meet a lot of dangers, except for maybe uh, ships, uh, and, and, but uh, normally they, it's, it's not such a burden for them like it is, for, for example, for Arctic Terra. Mothers and their young then swim close together, I mean when they're on their way back, often touching one another with the flippers. And it actually happens to be, a, appears to be a gesture of, of affection. So uh, why do they, again, uh, why do they travel to the warmer waters for, for mating and to give birth? That's, uh, that's easy. Uh, the, the first isn't seems quite easy because the newborn calves are not as covered by blubber, by fat, 
as the adult ones. So they need warmer waters to reduce energy loss during the winter. They wouldn't be able to survive or uh, to so prolific in cold waters. So they need warm waters after right after they are born. Another thing is it is probably a strategy again to escape predators. Uh, and what could uh, who is humpback uh, humpback whale afraid of a killer whale orcas uh, and not the adult ones the the adult ones are usually not in danger but uh, the young ones the offspring they they might be killed by uh, by killer whale uh, so and they are able to defend themselves against orcas easier if they are in shallow warm waters than deep cold water ocean uh, arctic uh, regions or uh, antarctic regions so it could be also be the strategy so again to protect the young to protect the the calves uh, and the, the, those this migration period takes some time three weeks sometimes up to six months with no eating and no sleeping uh, at all so it can be exhausting it might not be as dangerous but it's really really uh, exhausting and on the way they need to uh, uh, they, they cannot feed at all and normally they uh, eat a lot of food more than uh, almost one and a half ton of food uh, per day of those krill uh, cow pots and and so on so the strategy uh, at the migration um, trigger would be mostly in, in this in the case of humpback uh, whales would be protection of cows of their offspring against predators and against cold temperature because the cows do not have enough protection uh, body protection body fat yet after they're born of course uh, uh, the climate change uh does not uh rapid climate change does not support any kind of stability in the animal world including uh well renowned well established patterns behaviors routes of migration so it's like the animals cannot follow uh, follow up fast enough or adapt fast enough uh so they rely on seasonal cues as we know on sunlight but also on temperature to decide when it's time to take their movements so when those cues are no longer reliable especially temperature and precipitation especially in the rapidly warming arctic the question of climate change and migration becomes more and more uh, pressing uh, for example, in, uh, let's finish with an example of uh, caribou maybe. So if you have a very, very snowy winter and then a warm, very warm and rapid spring, the snow becomes very heavy, uh, sort of slushy. And for anyone who ever done, has ever done any cross-country skiing, the worst, the most difficult snow to travel is heavy, wet snow. So those caribou that migrate, uh, that travel hundreds of kilometers to gather in very specific locations to give birth, nurse their young calves, they they already have a, a lot of, face a lot of difficulties on the way. But if they have to struggle through this very heavy very slushy snow, uh, the poor conditions prevent the mother caribou from making it to the calving grounds. And so it's tougher for the females, especially, and tougher for the calves. So it can influence their uh, not only life expectancy, but survival expectancy uh, significantly because the warm spring comes earlier and faster than it should and the result of, of snow uh, before. So there are a lot of practical, very practical uh, 
conditions and pr practical changes that seem small uh, at the first sight, but then it turns out they can prevent uh, animals from uh, from giving from mating, from giving birth uh, birth to, to to the offspring. So sometimes. Uh, uh, also, I mentioned that those pit stop, that stopover sites, for example, along the coast are under threat of disappearing, for example, due to rising sea levels and so on and so on. So at some point, uh, migration might become less profitable for various animals, especially terrestrial animals, such as, for example, uh, caribou. So we might observe that the uh, balance between gain and loss uh, may, may make uh, migratory patterns to be less and less, uh, often less and less uh, observed as another adaptation to climate change. Thank you very much.